This episode of the Sloopcast is brought to you by the Mad Canadian Barbecue Company. Mad Canadian Barbecue Company is an Ohio-based company where we usually say our seasoning will take your barbecue from good to great. Great seasoning such as the Mad Hatter, the Old Fashioned, Four Horsemen, and the Carey Steak. You can't go wrong with any of those seasonings. Be sure to check out all the f- amazing seasonings over at the Mad Canadian BBQ Company dot com for all their seasonings. Be sure to use the new promo code Old Man Thirty. That is Old Man O L D M A N three zero at checkout for thirty thirty percent off. Not just ten percent when you sloopcast ten. It is thirty using Old Man. 30. We don't know how long that lasts, by the way. We asked yeah. him. We don't have feedback on that. So so you, be- so you better hurry in soon. I'd hurry. Better, better hurry and get your 30% off. Again, old man 30. Mad Canadian Barbecue Company. They have your and butt Just in case, in case that doesn't, Sloopcast 10 is still there. Yes. Sloopcast 10 is still available. But old man 30, all that more. Mad Canadian Barbecue Company dot com. MadCanadianBBQ.com <laughs> Alright, YouTubers. This is where you and I get to, to do a little chat. This is where the podcasters, just the, the podcast audio-only listeners, listen. And This is where you and I get to have a little chat as, as the, the podcast-only folk. We're doing something a little weird today. Be forewarned. Better, better drink up, Jared. I don't have any alcohol on me right now. I'm a little dehydrated. All right. I might drink if I were like you, and I got to just like be done once it was done. <laughs> but I have editing and stuff to do. So. All right, let's do this. We've got barbecue back here. You're all invited. Welcome to. The Sloopcast, how are you doing today, Kyle? Do you have to ask that? Do no. you have to ask that? No. No. Yeah, um, what's changed since we recorded last, Kyle? Um, everything. Well, first the season was canceled. And then it wasn't. And then it was. <laughs> um, oh, but no, 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 guys, it's not canceled. It's postponed. And I I don't know. I mean, you've all heard and read a lot of people's opinions. And if you follow me on Twitter, I've been throwing my opinions out there um, about what has happened and why it doesn't make sense and why the spring season doesn't make sense and maybe why the January season could make sense but also still might not make sense and... I feel like you guys have been inundated with a lot of that over the the past week. And I don't know what new there is to add to it. Except the only, the only other... to fix everything from the ground up, which is what we're going to do today. Yes. We're going to fix been, it all. There's been some waves with parents of the players yeah. and Justin Fields coming out with a petition to sign yeah. which as we're as we're recording this just four hours into it he already has well over a hundred thousand signatures yeah and what what time are we are we recording right now kyle it is a little after three o'clock there you go so yeah that that's where that's at right now um that's that leads us into a good question from from austin um He asks, will the Justin Fields petition cause any change? How much more pressure does this put on Warren, the new Big Ten commissioner, if you're not familiar with who Warren is? I honestly think that the letters, uh, we saw letters from Nebraska parents, from Penn State parents, from Ohio State parents, um, Iowa, what, Iowa parents, um, I... I get that. So, I mean, as we're recording this, the Justin Fields thing is the piece of news right now. 
So that feels really, really big right now. And because it's a petition that's snowballing, it's growing just tremendously right now. It's just bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it feels like a really big thing. And I'm not saying that it's not a big thing, but if you're talking about how this could be received by the people actually in charge of making decisions, the parent letters to me carry a lot more weight than a football player saying, I want to play football and a bunch of fans signing it for, you know, and I, I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about change.org or any of the other petition gathering websites, but I would be curious to know at what percentage. I mean, we were doing this a few weeks ago with renaming Columbus to Flavortown. How did that work out? <laughs> it's, I, don't, I, I get it. It's, 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 it's great and it's fun and it's, it's a player putting himself out there and diverging from the status quo. And I am all for all of that. To me, the, the, parent letters you know in this hyper fast news cycle already feels like it was a week ago the parent letters even that was uh, you know two or three days ago those to me have more impact but that being said i still just don't think they have much impact i don't think the big 10 as a whole is not i don't i don't want to say it's not doing it like i know something i know what you guys know and I, I don't see it. I don't see the Big Ten reversing course as a as a conference at all. I just don't see it happening. I mean, this is the same conference that people have been just ragging on all week about just a lack of leadership, a lack of just consistency from this organization. There's just nothing. So for us to believe that they're going to all of a sudden change their decision it's not going it's not going to happen and it's just it's just crazy too like they make this decision they're like yep we're not doing we're not having football anymore but yet there was no communication right on what to do with the players afterwards Heck, even the parents came out and even the letters too. The parents didn't know until they saw it in the news media. There's right. no communication from the Big Ten at all. They found out when the rest of us found out, which is just mind-boggling and just it terrible. Just terrible. It, it should it, be it really mind-boggling. Is. However, this is the low bar that the Big Ten and the NCAA have set. It should be mind-boggling, but it's not. Like, I'm not at all surprised to hear that now or when I first heard it, you know, when those letters came out. Mm -hmm. and, not, and, a lot of, and a lot of people, including including myself, and I, I'm going to assume you too, Jared, when, when this Don't was first announced. <laughs> all right. Well, at least for myself, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, just like – Fans of universities in the Big Ten, they don't really care about unity within the Big Ten like, no. like fans do with universities in the SEC when you keep hearing chants of SCC, SCC. Yeah, no, I don't think don't, anyone outside the SEC no. gives so much of a damn about their there, There's a few in the ACC that does. I feel like those are mostly bottom dwellers trying to ride off of Clemson's success. But then again, that's also probably what's happening in the SEC. It is. It absolutely is. But so I think that's why you're seeing a lot of fans really come out and say, screw the Big Ten. Yeah. Let's get out of the Big Ten, join the SEC, the Big 12, whatever it is. You just see a lot of fans just being able to or wanting Ohio State to jump ship. Which is not really realistic. Any... It's not. It'd be nice, but it's not. <laughs> I don't... So that's why you that's why you don't really see any kind of loyalty in the Big Ten, because especially with Ohio State fans, to me and I might just it might just sound bad because of me being an Ohio State fan, but really Ohio State 
doesn't really need the Big Ten. The Big no. Ten needs Ohio State more. Yeah. And I don't think Ohio State pulls that weight enough. I'm not saying you go full Texas about it. Because yes. Texas pulls their weight too much in the Big 12, uh, which is a large part of the reason why Nebraska left the Big 12 and why mm-hmm. the, the, the Southwest Conference doesn't even exist anymore before they jump ship to what was the Big 8 and became the Big 12 and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because these are surface level issues and we're trying to get to the root of the problem. Now, before we do that, real quick, uh, recruiting. Uh, Tumise Adelier uh, has decommitted from Ohio State. This isn't a huge surprise. We told you tons of decommitments are coming. I still believe Ohio will be net, Ohio State will be net positive at the end of these, of this of this decommitment cycle that's coming. Um, this does not phase me. If anything, it kind of makes me feel better, you know, because Adelie is a defensive end. It kind of makes me feel better that maybe potentially, you know, because we've been hearing some things about our, our two guys from Washington maybe shopping around and maybe not being, because it's hard. If there's no foreseeable travel in the future, and those guys are in Washington. How do they? How does JTT? How does the Mecca Abuka? You you can understand why they might be at least exploring other options. Um, but the maybe a Delier leaving might bolster the possibility. You know, why did Adelie leave? We don't really have an explanation on that. Maybe something's happening with JTT. And I, again, I don't know anything that you guys don't know on that, but that's just sort of me reading tea leaves. That's all we can do at this point. Yeah. Um, Evan Pryor and Jack Sawyer are both foregoing their senior years of football uh, to be prepared to enroll early. Uh, you have to think that this is, there's talk that the early enrollees might be able to participate if there is a spring season, which eh, I, I, I'm not, I'm not holding out any hope for that. Again, maybe if it's January and not a spring season, maybe if it's a winter season and maybe if all five of the power five conferences do it, then I might believe that a winter slash spring season could actually happen. But until that happens, I'm just, I'm not, until all five conferences get on board, I'm, I'm not worried about it. And, by, and for the record, I don't believe that either of the three conferences currently holding out are going to play in September or October or any of, of that. I don't believe that's happening either, but that's besides the point. Um, but I, I think there's a there's talk that if there is an Ohio State spring season, winter season, that potentially that these early enrollees could participate in it somehow. And that might be why we're seeing Sawyer and Pryor and probably more players here coming up in the future who are going to really focus on enrolling early. And as, uh, you know, as p- potentially preparing for playing college football in the spring. Something to keep an eye on. All right, Kyle, a quick question from our... We don't have a nickname for Dinger yet, do we? No, we're not going to force one, but quick question from Dinger. He says, my thoughts are this. Uh, A, with Title IX and name, image, likeness rights... Uh, are mutually exclusive and will require lots of hard work. B, university presidents actually like sharing... Don't... <laughs> that, that that apostrophe T was important. Uh, university presidents don't actually like sharing power with coaches and hate hard work. So ask Sloopcast, did collegiate sports just end? Did collegiate sports just end? That sounds like a crazy question. I don't believe it is. And it might be 
Uh, by the way, the Mad Canadian Barbecue Company promo code goes till Friday. We just uh, received input from the Mad Canadian himself. But I don't believe that is a crazy question. I have long predicted that a semi-pro model is in the future for the big for the Big Ten, for college football as a whole. Um, oh, I need to get rid of that tile real quick. Do not show non-video participants. There we go. Mad Canadians now in the video. Um, sorry, what was I saying? Yeah, uh, collegiate football is going to have to make a move into some sort of semi-pro model eventually. And it's one thing to say that, it's another thing to actually try and lay out a plan to do it, which, Kyle, is what I have done. Um, with Kyle's input and assistance, I have actually written a, what amounts to about a four page, five if you count pictures, <laughs> a four page manifesto a four page uh plan as to a why college football is broken b what ha what needs to happen to fix it and c is this realistic so that those are sort of the that's sort of the ground we're going to cover with this we're going to read it and then just sort of talk about it as we go Kyle, do do you want to do you want to do the reading? Yep, sure. Let's <clears throat> let's go ahead and start this off and to kind of emphasize though this is our plan to fix college football, not just a plan, but it is a it's a radical plan. Well, you better still. believe, Kyle, that's going to be the name of this episode: a radical plan <laughs> to fix college football. Yes. All right. So let's go ahead and start from the top here. College football is broken. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the playoff system is inconsistent and filed with bias. Increased revenue isn't being shared with the players. Strength of schedule varies widely between teams. The NCAA provides no leadership and the conferences can't get on the same page. Revenue gaps between universities necess necessitate near exhibition games that no one wants to watch. Mid-major teams have no opportunity to advance and power five bottom feeders make no effort to improve. Uh, you know, 2020 has taught us that there's no leadership. The conferences don't communicate. The conferences can't come to conclusions, agreements with the, within each other. And when you look at the NCAA for guidance, they say, eh. I mean, they literally just came out and said, well, we'll let the conferences figure it out. Where's the leadership? College football has no leadership. So and how do we fix this? Well, we'll get there. Uh, let's see. The playoff committee is best possible solution given the deep deeply rooted issues within college football. Pro leagues use point systems and records to determine playoff seeds, but this won't work in college football because the strength of schedules are too inconsistent. The playoff committee is like putting a slip cover over a broken down old couch. Is it better? Yeah. Is it good? No. To create a fitting conclusion to college football, we must fix the underlying problems. The problem with the pro, uh, excuse me, with the postseason is not the playoff committee. It's not that the playoff committee is too inconsistent. It's that the task given to the playoff committee is impossible. Mm -hmm. There's just way too many teams. You got 130 teams to Plus. look at. And, and yes, you can take three quarters of the teams and throw them out every year um for the most part and just really concentrate on 30 team 30 teams every year but, but still, the problem have, is is that those 30 teams are playing the other 100 teams correct yes 
Yes, absolutely. So you have no consistency of of playing similar teams, and you may once in a while be like, "Oh, hey, this team played this um, bottom dweller team, and they only won by fifty points, but this one won. This team won by sixty five points. Right? It's not. A, it's not a good comparison. The opinions. Excuse me. The opinion that colleges should be paying players seems to gain more support every year. My personal opinion on the subject has shifted in that direction over the years. Name image likeness allowances is a step in the right direction, but just a band-aid. Unfortunately, paying players is not as easy as cutting them a check. Just paying the football and basketball teams won't comply under Title IX. Paying all the student athletes equally is cost prohibitive even for the wealthier schools, but an absolute non-starter for the less wealthy. How do we pay players without viola violating Title IX? I'm building up to a thing here. I'm just I'm telling you what's wrong and why it's not easy to fix it. We're building up to a thing here. You, I mean, you. Uh, I mean, I already said it. It's not as simple as just paying players. It's all sorts of legal and governmental restrictions in the way of that. Variation between schedule strength is rooting in two underlying causes. Number one is schools make make their own schedules. And then number two, college football's enormous talent gap. The issue is one of the most publicly debated as every fan base widely overestimates the strength of their conference and their team's strength of schedule. Why? Because there is no good metric for measuring strength of schedule. Wins over top 25 teams? That relies on biased polls and circular debates about when they played versus where they are ranked now. Computer formulas are either shrouded in mystery or can become manipulated once their formula is known. This is called Goodhart's Law. College football must ensure that their best teams play each other more often than a few times a century. But how? Again, we need consistency with who the top teams are playing. We cannot compare what Ohio State and Alabama and LSU and Clemson and Oregon and USC and Texas and Oklahoma, we can't compare how good these teams are unless they are playing consistent schedules. Furthermore, who does it benefit to never see these teams play each other? We all lost our gaskets a few weeks ago because Ohio State put Alabama on the schedule for 10 years from now. Ohio State and Alabama, two of the most storied franchises in all of college football, have played a grand total. I was is the number three times. We you don't have to look it up, Kyle. It's it's under ten, right? Yeah. They've both been playing football for over a century. They're the two most storied, two of the most storied programs in all of college football, and they have almost never. If we do a by year average, almost never played each other. That is a problem that no one seems interested in fixing except for us. Moving on here, the revenue gap in college was bigger than weight rooms, practice fields, indoor waterfalls, and in-house barber shops. It's about creating rules that are supposed to govern both Texas who grossed nearly $225 million just a couple of years ago, and Sunbelt teams who grossed less than $20 million. We cannot continue to have conversations about playing, paying players and everything else that needs fix in college football so long as we keep pretending that these institutions are operating in the same universe. These smaller revenue athletic departments are forced to place their athletes in meaningless no-win competitions in order to balance their spreadsheets. Look at the Mac schools, for instance. Sunbelt schools These are even poorer. I, I researched all this. Yeah. Believe me, the Mac schools have money compared to the Sunbelt teams. Yeah, it's... 
it's big, it's a big big concern i mean that, that was one of the concerns that even my first thoughts when they came out and said said that big 10 is not playing or even just in general um a lot of the power five conferences weren't going to play my first one of my first thoughts is oh look at the bowling green and miami ohio's of the world they're not going to be able to to keep their athletic department open or they're going to have to they're going to have to start closing or canceling certain programs that's coming any i mean that's coming that's coming Mm -hmm. across the board there's going to be a lot of sports canceled that will probably never come back because once these once they realized how much money a lot of these athletic programs were costing the universities a lot of them will never ever come back and we're, we're going to see a reduction in the number of sports played in college across the board. And it, again, I don't think it ever recovers. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sad to see just because of just some sports that don't get a lot of attention that you just, you won't see again yeah. at all. Let's see. Uh, next paragraph, Boise State. UCF, Memphis, why do we continue to treat these programs as second class? Have they not earned a chance at more? TCU and Utah are exceptions. These teams should not have to wait around for the next great conference reshuffle that seems to happen every 20 years. Meanwhile, every major conference has a few teams that seem happy to do nothing more than to cash their TV checks. Conferences are caste systems, the aristocracy are granted wealth and opportunity because of their bloodline and mid-majors are forever regu- relegated to plow someone else's field with little to no, that, that's the wrong no, I'll, remind me to fix that Kyle, with little to no, oh you're right in the document, you got it for me, uh, chance at upward mobility. Point is, is that you know, think of your favorite mid-major program. I'm sure there are people listening to this podcast who, even if Ohio State is your team, that you still like Cincinnati. Does Cincinnati not, have they not earned an opportunity to participate, to at least get a chance at the amount of money that the big conferences earn that allow them to advance their program to maybe somehow some way someday compete for national championships i mean yeah, it's, absolutely it's generally I mean, look, look at the past look at the past 15 years under two different head coaches where they got they broke the top 25 multiple weeks and yeah versus you look at other teams like like Rutgers or Vanderbilt or teams that, like you said, they just, they're there fine just getting their their TV uh, checks and signing it to cash it into the bank. But but look at TCU and Utah. U- Utah gets Urban Meyer, becomes a better program. The Pac-12 was looking for a 14th team. They pick up Utah and Utah has been on the cusp of making the playoffs a few times. TCU has been on the cusp of making the playoffs a few times because the Big 12 was looking to get teams in the conference. And now they start getting that big boy conference money and they're able to take that next step. And TCU and Utah are both respectable programs who I think could easily be playoff teams, especially if we see a playoff expansion at some point, easily become playoff teams in the next few years. Yep. Point is, is that that upward mobility, a lot of teams have earned it, but have not been able to actually, because their, their spike, because their great seasons didn't align perfectly with the you know, great conference reshuffles that happen every, like I said, maybe 20 or so years. We want to be able to see teams earn their way to the top. But that is not, that's not something that's being afforded to them. Yep. So now comes, Jared, the time. 
it's to break the wheel. It, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously a Game of Thrones reference, yes. in which we're talking about. Which I'm in all which, for. I'm all for. <laughs> <laughs> but but this is this is what Danny was talking about before the writers made her crazy with little to no motivation at the end. But that's a that's a different podcast. The <laughs> the point here is that. The slaves shouldn't be slaves simply because they were born slaves. The serfs, the laborers, these people shouldn't be stuck in this system simply because there's no opportunity at upward mobility. I didn't mean to rhyme there. Apologies. Point is, is that I would like to see a system that rewards the Cincinnati's and the Memphises, Memphises, Memphi of the world and punish the Illinois of the world who mm -hmm. make seemingly no strides or care to make any strides to be any what more than Lovie they Smith? are. What about Lovey Smith? Lovey Smith is one guy. What are they paying their assistants? What do their facilities look like? It's more than just getting, oh, that guy used to be the Bears coach. And I think he'll do good things there, but it, it takes it takes more. All right. So I, what follows here is the plan to fix college football, according to the Sloopcast folks. <laughs> it's our be plan. Warned, yes. Be warned, everyone. It's it is radical, and many traditions Kyle, will have. Can to I fall. stop you? Mm -hmm. I think we want to hear from our good friend, the Mad Canadian, who, by the way, says he likes your polo. Oh, thank you. So. <laughs> Let's talk a bit about the Mad Canadian. Uh, now through Friday, the Friday after this post, we are doing Old Man 3-0, Old Man 3-0 to get 30% off your entire order at themadcanadianbbq.com. You can find a link to the Mad Canadian site in the master link, which is in the show notes. Uh, let's see, I'm holding the savory right now. Uh, this is great on shredded chicken, shredded pork, all sorts of things. Um, I like to use it when I'm doing anything shredded. Uh, it's it's garlic and additional spices. It's fantastic. I love it. Uh, I got the Jared Sonoran loves, heat. Jared loves anything garlic. This is, this is a fact. I've not <laughs> met the, the phrase "too much garlic" is not in my is not in my playbook. That's the Sonoran heat. This is one of your kick butt do it all style um seasonings not really sure uh, i'm not really sure what to put on this one it's it's just sort of a chicken dish but it's not like a it's not really like a mediterranean dish or an italian i'm not really sure what to do i will just throw the sonoran heat on there you want to do something but you're not exactly sure what you got this you got the s p bud uh the, these are your utility players they can do it all for you yep you could put it on chicken you can put it on fish or even even give your uh, burgers a nice little kick. Yeah, uh, this one has uh, Himalayan pink salt, chili powder, mm -hmm. cumin, granulated garlic, black pepper, minced onion, paprika, and additional spices. I also love cumin. Kyle's like, oh, Jared loves his garlic. And I do. It's not He's not wrong. But I love cumin, too. Uh, got the coffee in Q. That's, that's, just, that's got coffee in it. It's coffee and it's barbecue, and I, I like it. You know, in case you want to, you know what I'm thinking for this one, and I haven't tried it yet, but I think I just thought of this, and I'm going to do it now. Steak and eggs. Sounds I feel like, like that's a winner. A, I feel like that's a steak and egg seasoning right there. You can find out for yourself by picking up that bottle or all of the bottles. And by the way, I, I happen to know for a fact there's some there's some new ones in the lab coming up, but nah, I can't say anything yet. Can't say it yet. There's more coming, but for what's available right now, for this week only, the sale ends on Friday. I think it's because it's someone's birthday. Mad Canadian's birthday. Everyone wish Mad Canadian a birthday. You can get all of this and more. Old Man 30 at checkout. Old Man 30 at checkout. The Mad Canadian Barbecue Company, they have your butts covered. All right, Kyle. Now. Don't time to break the wheel it's time to break the wheel uh All what right. follows is my plan to fix college football be warned it's radical and many traditions will die 
This is a complete destruction of what is to build what should be. Is this realistic? From a practical standpoint, I believe that it is. Would the instant would the influential institutions actually implement this plan or even one like it? Likely not. College football romanticizes tradition and hates change. This is why we are and have been robbed of meaningful postseasons. Radical overhauls are not in the college football playbook. But it would take only a relative few of the nation's most powerful programs to light this fuse. Below is our four-step plan to fix college football. Number one. Number one. You go right ahead. <laughs> Number one. Each university transitions their football program into a private corporation that is wholly owned by the university themselves, but is a legal, but is legally separate entity. Uh, I. Whoa. Okay. We'll just have to go forward with that. A bit of a lighting change. <laughs> um, lost my train of thought. Getting back on track. Yeah. I'll, I mean, I, I don't want to talk about my, my private life too much, but I'll say this. I work in my real life. I work for a company that is a nonprofit company that does wholly own a few for-profit companies. This is legal. This is common practice. It's totally within the realm of possibilities that would allow these universities to spin off their football programs, potentially their entire athletic departments, but that's not a distinction I want to get lost in right now, into a corporate entity that they wholly own, but is its own legal entity. Number two leave the NCAA but only football. We're we're maybe more, but for the sake of this conversation, mm -hmm. we're sticking to football. Yep. And number three, all conferences would be dissolved for football only. That is correct. And then, num and then number four, in football, it would form a multi league semi pro association. This is where the magic happens. You leave the college football restriction, whether it be legal restrictions such as Title IX, whether it be financial restrictions, university restrictions in trying to keep up this image of being fair and equal and, and all of these things that institutions like to try to pretend to be. Instead, we need to move into a private corporation that acknowledges that yes, the football players generate more money and the basketball players. That depends upon the university, obviously, but we're, we're, we're focused on football right now. They earn more money. Therefore, they get more money. Period. The first three steps facilitate the fourth. They allow football football programs to operate without the legal and institutional restrictions that apply to universities' NCAA membership. This allows football programs to self-govern and pay their athletes, which is what we just mentioned. Leaving conferences solves the cast problem, allowing for upward mobility and rewards succeeding football programs. This places college football under a single commissioner who can provide leadership and consistent rules that apply evenly to all teams. And we have named it the Leader. college of Sorry. We, we and we have named this this self-governing program the College Football Association, the CFA. I I'm I'm not tied to the name. <laughs> It just felt like the generic sort of thing that, anyway. Um, yeah, what have we been talking about? No leadership. The conferences can't get on the same page. The NCAA has no interest in providing any leadership. Yeah. Conferences like the Big Ten are not communicating or governing 
or ruling whatever word you want to use effectively. The Big Ten could have done, practically speaking, the exact same thing this week, but with a lot less turmoil had things been communicated effectively. Even if we're talking about, well, the Big Ten just had to deliver the bad news. This is how it has to be, and yada, yada, yada. It still creates an atmosphere of negativity when you deliver it the way they did. And again, now we're like the Pac-12 then follows. Now this puts pressure on the Big 12 and the SEC and the ACC. What are they going to do? Even if they win, an, what if you're Clemson and you win a national championship this year? You're going to put a big old asterisk next to that? Because Ohio State, who everyone, not just us, everyone, was this, this year it's Ohio State and Clemson. Are you just going to take Ohio State completely? You think that national championship isn't going to get a big old asterisk next to it? That's not fair to Clemson. Even if, even if everyone who's currently saying they're going to play plays. It, th that national championship is going to carry a lot less meaning. Yeah. Point is, is that we need leadership and we need to fall under a single organization. Mm -hmm. Now the question, Jared, how do we reward successful programs and how do we create legitimate postseason, and how do we create schedules that are consistent and competitive? Well, uh, under our under our system here on how to fix college football, create a new system of multiple leagues under one governing body. Uh, this model will look very familiar to anybody who watches who watches English football leagues, uh, even even Spanish even Spanish it, football. This leagues. is the common. This is the common sports model across yes. European sports, even through Correct. hockey yeah. and basketball. This is yes. a well-tested model. I'm not trying to completely reinvent the wheel, even if this feels foreign, and, and it is foreign, but even <laughs> if this feels foreign to someone, and I feel like most people do, I haven't, I didn't even start paying attention to, you know, European soccer, football, whatever you want to call it until somewhat recently. So I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be like, oh, for those of you who don't, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to do that. Cause again, this is relatively new to me as well. Point is, is that this is not new. This is how most sports organizations work in Europe. It might feel foreign, but it's a well-tested system. And it works. It does work. It does, yes. So we have modeled a five league system. This could prove this could prove to be too many, but we've worked under the assumption that there would be a part of the lower league instead of being left behind in a post apocalyptic wasteland of college football. Uh, first league, and again, this is just all something that Jaron I and others in our in our the Discord our, had our, some input. Our sloop cats, our sloop have, cats, yes, <laughs> have um, assisted on naming two. So the first league, we'll call it the the top, the cream of the top here. We call it the Champions League. I know some don't like it being called Champions and all that, but you know what? It it really it really should be because I mean that's ultimately where you're going to find a name, the national champion. Uh, so this league would consist of 24 of the best teams in college football. 24 teams and having a 12-game schedule it means that every team gets to play half of the league. So then there, right there, Jared, you would have similar schedules. You would have similar opponents, not, not all the time, but you would have similar opponents to be able to really tell – how a team performs and how well they actually are instead of trying to determine, oh, well, we played Troy and we beat them by 40, but we beat them by 55 and we had Kyle. 200 more yards. Finish the paragraph, then we'll talk about it. All right. <laughs> Each team may have one protected game to preserve rivalries. 
However, <laughs> there will be no interleague play, meaning tier one won't play tier two, et cetera, et cetera. An 18 playoff will be seeded based on winning percentage in the list of predetermined tiebreakers similar to the NFL system. Point is, is that even if the schedules aren't 100% even, like in the NFL, the schedules are not 100% even. But no more can you say, you didn't play nobody, Paul. Because <laughs> what if the absolute worst team you play, I mean absolute bottom rung worst team you play all year, is Oklahoma State. What if the absolute worst team you play all year is Texas? Absolute worst team you play all year is Boise. NFL schedules aren't exactly even. But they are even enough that the NFL can simply say, oh, you went 11 and 4. 11 and 5. You went 11 and 5. And that's good enough for the second seed in the playoff. And you went 12 and 4. And that means you get the first seed in the playoff. And the third seed, well, we have a tiebreaker system because you both went 10 and 6. They're even enough that we can rely on simply saying, this is your record, this is your seed. That's a ridiculous system in the current college football model. Mm -hmm. Because that just encourages teams to play the Troys and the, I, I don't want to keep crapping yeah. on teams, but <laughs> this allows for a pro style playoff system to be enacted. The next three leagues will consist of about 32 teams each. And a fifth can contain up to 32 teams, or whatever the case may be. Uh, all will play a 12-game season and use the same playoff module as model. the champion model as the Champions League and crown a champion in their league then as well. Makes sense. But well, why yeah, would in, it... In that Again, if you're a program who, for maybe geographical restrictions, um, if you're a program, financial restrictions, geogra maybe you're just never going to make it to that Champions League and you're never going to compete for that national title. Well, guess what? Now you, have, you still can try to be the champion of mm -hmm. the third or second tier. You still have a thing to play for against relative competition. Mm -hmm. And again, there's only 24 teams in that top league. There's still going to be lots of star power, lots of influential, brand-worthy, interesting universities in both the second and third tiers. Absolutely. Yep. But why would a team, especially one in a major conference, want to be part of the fourth or fifth league? The same reason Mac and Sunbelt teams spend their Septembers in 80 plus thousand seat stadiums getting boat raced money. If the nation's top 15 or 20 football programs leave the NCAA for this new league, less valuable teams will be forced to make a choice, either join the association or be left behind in whatever's left in college football. Point is, is that if the big dogs go away, you have to follow. Mm -hmm. You gotta what, go where the money's what, at. If Ohio State and Penn State and Michigan and Nebraska, if these teams leave the Big Ten, what's left of the Big Ten? So what are you gonna do? You're gonna play for fictional national titles in whatever's left of college football with TV contracts that just became null and void with no star power? Or are you going to participate in this new league? Mm -hmm. You don't need to get all 130 plus teams on board. You really only need to get the top 15 or 20 teams on board. And at that point, you the other programs really just don't have a choice but to join up or they just become irrelevant because they're not a part of the new thing. Mm. And also Can financially they have to. Because if you're no if you're not a part of the new thing, where's your money coming from? The Mac schools and the Sunbelt schools 
play in these games that they have no chance at winning because financially speaking, that's what has to happen to allow their athletic departments to run. Well, why would Illinois, why would Indiana agree to be a part of the third tier of this new football league? Well, I, I don't know if they have much choice in the matter. Yep. Teams in higher leagues will receive a higher cut in TV profits, but there will be plenty of money to share. This new college football association would own the TV rights for all of its members, giving it exclusive ownership for all major college football TV rights for potentially up to 152 teams playing up to 76 games a week. Join up or be left behind. Mm -hmm. But what about upward mobility? This is this is where the what happens overseas here. This is the European model. Yep. Two words: promotion and relegation. Anybody who follows football slash soccer would understand this. If you're familiar with English football league or other European soccer organizations, then you've heard these words and probably have some idea of what they mean. If not, here's your crash course. Promotion and relegation is a system where teams are transferred between leagues at the conclusion of each season. Best teams from a lower league are promoted to the next league, up replacing the worst teams from that higher level. The English Football League, for example, promotes and regulates the three best and worst teams from each league. Four teams, however, would be the ideal number for this model here as it works neatly with the eight playoff mo eight team playoff model. Promotion re regulation will help maintain competitive balance, reward success, punish failure, and create high levels of importance for games played by struggling teams at the end of the season who are trying to avoid relegation. It also, two also works. I mean, I said four, I think two also works. Store of Two would be a bit more of a stable system. Four would have more movement. Um, I personally think four would be better, but the powers at B, which are your wealthy organizations who have no opportunity to move upward, would probably prefer two because that means less of them are falling down to the next league. Mm -hmm. Point yeah. is, is that in that second league, maybe you have a national title for what I have deemed the prime league. I'm not tied to these names, but you got, I'm going to release the graphic on Monday and you guys can see the graphic for yourself. Um, point is, is that if you're Michigan state and you got put in that second tier, well, guess what? You want to join that first tier? go win the national title, go win the prime league national title. And even if you just make it to the championship game under a two promote, uh, a two team promotion relegation model, even if you make it to, even if you just make it to the championship game, you have guaranteed that you're playing in the next league up that next year. Yep. Or if you make it to the final four of that 18 playoff, then you're promoted depending upon mm -hmm. if we use two teams or four teams. Again, I prefer four. I think two would be more realistic. But hey, why would realism play into this radical, ridiculous system I'm putting forth? Mm. Yeah. All right, Jared. Biggest obstacle of standing in the way is that initial buy-in. Can you get the decision makers from the nation's most powerful football programs in the same room and have them all agree to jump off of the boat together. Can they agree on a set of rules? Will these programs enter into a system that allows new money programs to take their spot in the top league? Could we even get them to agree on a lunch order? We fear the answer is no. The programs with the power to affect meaningful change are the programs who benefit the most from the status quo. Yeah. Um the problem is, is that those top 20 programs aren't, I don't, I don't feel like that they're going to freely join a system that could see them relegated down to a second class league. That's the biggest flaw with this problem and why the two team 
promotion relegation system is m- more realistic. But mm-hmm. imagine Texas, who I think is by win loss record over the last ten years, which is how I I if you're saying to yourself, how do you decide what teams are in what leagues? I I mapped it out. I have a hundred and fifty, I don't know, hundred and forty some teams on a graphic where I've I've put them into tiers. Again, with the help of Kyle and our Discord, sort of shifted them around. I, the basis I used was win loss percentage over the last ten years. That was the basic model, and then I made a lot of adjustments. One of the biggest adjustments I made was putting Texas in that Champions League, where by pure record standpoints they did not deserve to be. But again. You can't not invite Texas to this meeting and you can't get Texas to buy into this meeting or into this system unless you are at least starting them in the Champions League. Mm-hmm. Yep. The Absolutely. idea, however, is that after a few seasons, this system balances itself. That's why this system works. Even if Texas doesn't deserve to be in the Champions League, they won't be anymore. Which is also why the Texases of the world probably won't agree to it. Yes. It The problem with this system is that it is too fair. <laughs> and that that does not benefit some of these historically relevant programs who are currently struggling. Texas, yep. USC, among others. Mm-hmm. All right, let's finish our... finish finish this plan here jared yeah. while we do believe college football must make the move into some sort of semi pro model eventually i fear it will be a locked system look at every american sports organization currently yeah we have just promotion and relegation which is you know the european model and then the locked system which is your north american model these are, you know, these are your major league baseball teams. These are your minor league baseball teams. And mm-hmm. it doesn't change no matter how good the Columbus Clippers are. They can never win a title and move up into the major leagues. Now imagine yes. that they could. Wouldn't that be fun? Yes. <laughs> this will leave too many great universities out because a league can only accommodate so many teams. I fear they will continue to utilize bowls and conferences because college football has never met a round hole they weren't willing to jam a square peg into. My Our proposed model would work. It's been demonstrated and tested in Europe for decades. However, it's also been demonstrated for decades that it takes a literal act of Congress to force change onto college football. The wheel is too powerful. Change is too scary. College football may indeed be too broken. The system would work. I I, I know that, it, I mean, again, Europe's done it for decades. This system would work. But I, again, the people in power would have to agree to a system that could relegate them if they struggle. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I'm pessimistic that they would do that. That is the biggest flaw with this problem is that it is not, I fear, realistic in that I don't think the teams that we would need to buy in would buy in. That's the mm-hmm. problem. Yeah, there, there's just going to be, yeah, it, that's the initial part. That's That's what's going to prevent anything from happening. It's just... The too powerful is unwilling to give up to the do power. Any kind of change. Yep. The, yep. the powerful don't want to let go of their power. Unless well, they're Ohio just, State, yeah, but, then they're completely well, willing to let Maryland and Rutgers well, tell them that they're not allowed to have football. Well, well not, not just that, but even the Rutgers and the Marylands also, where they, they don't want to give up what they have now because they're getting a lot of money. But the Maryland and Rutgers right. won't have a choice. They can either exist in what is left of college football after all the big programs leave, which they might do, which is why I said the five leagues might be too many. It, I worked under the assumption that a bunch of teams would want in on this. 
maybe that's not the case. And a lot of that has to do with how much money are the, because let's face facts, the Champions League and even the Prime League, which again, carries a lot of incredibly popular big money schools because I, I limited that initial league to only 24 teams. That's, that's what's going to turn on television sets. This system works because the teams that are making the money have to share some money with the lower tier teams, which they already do right now. Ohio State shares money with Buffalo when they invite them to come into the university on a random September Saturday and beat the living crap out of them. That, that's them sharing money with Buffalo. This is just sharing money with Bowling Green and Buffalo in a different manner that also allows Ohio State... Ohio State's schedule could be week one, Clemson, week two, Alabama, Georgia, Wisconsin, Notre Dame, Penn State, Texas A&M, Florida, Michigan, Oklahoma... I already said it. No, I didn't. Oklahoma, LSU, Boise State. That could be Ohio State's schedule. And everyone else is playing a schedule of similar strength. And I think that's the you, key. You, you think you're going to still have trouble selling tickets? Oh, no. No one wants to come see Ohio State play Bowling Green. Well, here's your, here's your problem with fixing mm -hmm. people actually wanting to come to games. And, that, and that's the key thing too that I really like about this here is what you said. You're playing teams of similar strength. Yes. I mean, you can look at some of these and like, oh, look here. Uh, the, in the third league here, why like you would have like Arkansas versus Indiana. As of go. right now, yeah, they, they'd be very similar. Or even if you want to go down even but further. But I like that I even have teams like in that third league that you're talking about, Georgia Southern who was an FCS school just mm -hmm. not that long ago. But by win-loss, this is where they deserve to be. You know, but then they also get to play, I think that's Troy and Temple, UCLA, which, by the way, is where they deserve to be. Point is, is that if you are in a league, that I, I didn't put, except for Boise, who I think is maybe the only school who's done it, somewhat consistently for a long time, there were a lot of teams who deserved to be in that initial top 24, 26 teams who I didn't put based purely on, on win loss. So I didn't put in there. I think yeah. Ohio, the Bobcats have had an amazing win loss record over the past 10 years. I wasn't going to put, uh, you have to take into consideration strength of schedule. I wasn't going to put Ohio in the champions league. It just, it wasn't going to happen. Uh, and there were a few group of five teams who pure, pure win loss probably deserved to be in that champions league. But I put all those guys in the prime league and, and you, after a year or two or three, they can earn their way in to that champions league. You know, what's really great about this. Theoretically, you're going to rarely, and I mean, rarely have a team go undefeated every year. Oh, almost never. With this level of competition in and out, almost never. Yeah. It's, so it's going to be basically like the NFL. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially, like, we're worried about college football right now. It's like, oh, you can't even have, depending on your schedule, you can't even have one loss. Like Clemson. We talked about Clemson all last year. Clemson can't afford a loss or so they're not in the playoffs because of their schedule and all that. And we've said that a couple of times, too, with Ohio State. They had the one terrible loss in Purdue. Other than that one game against Purdue a few years ago, Ohio State looked great for the most part. This would help eliminate a lot of that. So you can have a slip up maybe two during, during the season. Kyle, it's an eight team playoff and it's a 24 team league. Yeah. A third you can have two of the you teams. Can have two slip ups. <laughs> a third of the teams will make the playoff. Yeah. And another thing that's really cool about this system, I, I mentioned it in the article, or the article, that's that's lofty. In my manifesto, I mentioned it in my manifesto uh, that if you're USC in Texas and you only have three wins, 
and then you're, you know, or maybe point is, is that if you're having a really bad season, it's not just, well, toss the season out or the rest of it doesn't matter. No, those last few games really, really matter because now you're trying to avoid that relegation. It creates interest, not just at the top of the league, but at the bottom of the league. The system works, I promise. It's worked in Europe for decades. And I just, I don't know how you form a semi, which I think college football eventually, maybe it takes 10 years, maybe it takes 15 years. Eventually, college football must move into some sort of semi-pro organization. And I just don't know how you take all five power five conferences and take all of those teams and put them all in the same semi-pro league and build some sort of locked system around it. Yep. And then you're just going to leave out Memphis and Boise and Cincinnati and all of these really good mid-major teams and just say, screw you guys, you can't be a part of our semi-pro league? How many teams can be a part of a league and have it be sustainable? This is how you manage having over a hundred teams in a semi-pro league. This is, this is how you do it. It's been modeled. We know this, it works. Will the powers it be actually do anything like this? I, I think they'd essentially have to be forced. Yeah, yep, absolutely. But it and works. It really all, and it really all starts essentially kind of like what we're seeing right here from the players and the parents and the coaches from these universities. That's where this would all start. This would take an actual act of Congress or I, I think a, a, a huge lawsuit of some sort. I, I don't see as great as I think this system would work. I don't see the powers in college football agreeing to it without somehow being forced into it yep that's it the system would work i promise you the system would work mm -hmm. i just don't know how we convince the teams to buy in yep all right kyle uh let's super duper do some quick sloopcast questions mm -hmm. okay we super duper yep super duper <laughs> okay. quick sun card asks um, as IT people, which Kyle and I are, how do you feel about screen time for children? I would say not all screen time is created equal. Not all television yes. is created equal. Not all time on a phone or iPad is created equal. Your child yes. watching Mr. Rogers or Sesame Street is not the same thing as your child watching ba Breaking Bad. You can't Agreed. just put screen time under one umbrella. Yes. Duncan from the Discord, why does the narrative of a team playing a season either in another conference or as an independent include the they'd be leaving the big 10 if Nebraska wants to go play with whoever else wants to play? Because the big 10 canceled the season. I think yes. a lot of the times people are using the phrase leave the big 10 as a shorthand of saying leave the big 10 for this season. It's just it's yeah. Twitter or I, I don't think Duncan is a is a is a Twitter user, but that I think a lot of the people, whenever they use the phrase "leave the Big Ten, there's an asterisk there that says "for this season," even if they aren't saying it. I think that's what most people are saying. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sunkar, do you think we will ever hear about who would have been the starters had there been a fall season? There weren't camps. The coaches don't know who the starters would have been. There weren't spring yep. camps. There weren't fall camps that were even in pads. There's no way of knowing who they would have been. There were tons of position battles that just didn't happen. Yep. Mad Canadian asks a couple questions here. Would the NFL be as accommodating about it if it's only the back Pac-12 and Big Ten that move it. There's a lot of talk about the NFL pushing back the combine, pushing back the draft. If but they can only go college, back so far, though. They, yes, absolutely. But there's a lot of talk that the NFL might be open to doing that 
if college football has to be played in the winter and or spring. And so Mad Canadian's asking us, will they still be this accommodating if it's only the Big Ten and the Pac-12? And I don't think so. No, not when there's you have the Players Association and in get involved to be way too messy. I, I don't think that I don't think I do not think that the Big Ten and the Pac-12 play a winter spring season. No, zero. I will zero if the other conferences don't also do it mm -hmm. without the, no. unless all five conferences agree on January one, we're starting the college football season. Then mm -hmm. it's not happening or maybe January two. <laughs> right, one more question. Would you relive the 1999 season? If it meant we had football this year? No. Uh, yes. Sure. I, football, football is football. I, yes, I, football, football is football, man. Football <laughs> is football. Um, one more question from Duncan from the Discord. Dumbest part of about the 2021 schedule: having to play the Gophers the week before the Ducks. Another randomly selected back. -to -back what, what is he even Penn's... referencing? Is he referencing a schedule that doesn't exist anymore? Maybe. <laughs> you randomly know what? select we back to back wanna... <laughs> with Penn State and and the team up north. Or the rest week being before Rutgers. Dumbest part about the schedule. Um, I would say probably back to back with Penn State and the team up north. That, that's always tough to do. Yeah, it's never easy. Yeah. Uh, last question. He asks one more. Does this hurt the powerful teams because they lose a loaded year? Have no effect because hashtag next man up or because the strong will eat the weak in times of struggle. Um, I think this hurts always, to me. The strong always eat the weak in times of struggle. However, the big... T so, this might help Ohio State against the rest of the Big Ten, but it hurts Ohio State where Ohio State cares, which yeah. is on the national stage, especially if... ACC and SEC play this October, which by the way, I'm still going to say, I don't think that they do. Yeah. And especially like we saw how good they can be here. Potentially one of the best offensive lines we've mentioned a number of times, Justin Fields, a couple of great running backs, the wide receiver core, one of the best in college. I don't want to talk. I really just don't want to talk about how great this team is for a season. That's not going to happen. That's yeah. just going to make me sad. All right, Kyle, that's all of our Ask Sloopcast questions. Um, want to encourage everyone to uh, check out our T Public store. Uh, this is one of our T Public shirts. It says, uh, I don't want to keep lifting my shirt up, but it says, <laughs> get, it says, get on our level. Uh, you can find a link to, you can either just Google T Public and Sloopcast, um, or you can. Uh, check out our master link. Our master link is in the show notes and it links you to all of our stuff, including the Patreon, the T public page, the mad Canadian, the YouTube page, Twitter stuff. All the links are in the master link. Um, let's see. I think that's it. As far as anything I want to plug, uh, do you have anything in Kyle's corner for this week? Um, just best of luck to the Blue Jackets. I know they're down 2-1 right now, but best of luck. Hopefully they can pull out another victory against Tampa like they did last year. Yep. And uh, I think that's it. Uh, check the show notes for the music that we're playing. I forgot to pick out a band like I normally do. If I can, Kyle, give me 30 seconds. I don't pick a band in 30 seconds. You call me out. And then I also just need you to talk for 30 seconds so that we don't have complete silence. Oh, Ooh, what's that? Talking for 30 seconds. Oh, TMC says we should play Arlo. We should absolutely do that. Arlo McKinley just released a new album this week. Thank you, Mad Canadian. Discord was quiet all episode, but then Mad Canadian sinks a, a just an absolute half quarter at the buzzer. Well played, Mad Canadian. Well played. Yeah, um, Arlen McKinley released a new album this week, and I'll play one of those songs. Hey, 
Mad Canadian, pick a song. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if he does it. We'll, we'll give him a few seconds. He's typing. We have typing from the Mad Canadian. He says, die Midwestern. All right, th- there's your song. Arlo McKinley, new album released well, last week now. Because, yeah. Go check that out. Uh, great Ohio country singer. Uh, so go check out Arlo McKinley. The name of this song is Die Midwestern. Make sure to check out the master link uh, down in the the show notes for all of the things. And with all of that being said, I'd like to encourage everyone to drink local beer, listen to local music, and of course, support your local podcasters. Once again, this is Arlo McKinley doing the song Die Midwestern. More private YouTube talk. How you doing, YouTube? <clears throat> this is a long episode. <laughs> oh, we've been doing long episodes. Last week was like, or maybe two weeks ago, was like a full hour and a half. We've been doing long episodes lately. It's fine. We'll be fine. Everything's fine. How you doing? <laughs> How you doing, YouTube? <laughs> I, You know, but yeah, thank you. Uh, TMC says, uh, but they're good. What? Well, hey. That. Yeah, we appreciate that. Uh, hey, TMC, what? give me two spices and I'll talk about them in the ad read when the uh, podcast listeners come back to us. Should I tell them about some of the secret ones? Ooh. Should I tell them about the secret ones? It's up to you, MC. Okay, well, uh, he says yes. So let's, let's do that real quick. Once... Want to once again thank Arlo McKinley for ending today's episode, and I want to thank the Mad Canadian for sponsoring today's episode. He helps make these podcasts happen, and we super duper appreciate him. He's given us permission to talk about the. Is it two new ones? I know about one of them. I know about the Don A, which is a new Italian blend that he's working on. He actually made some chicken uh, this week and sent us a picture, and it looks great. Uh, it's 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 an Italian blend. I'm not really sure what's happening in it yet. Uh, he says he's working on three, and they're coming out the end of August. Okay, so I know there's the Dawn A, and like I said, that's some sort of Italian blend. I don't have I don't have a lot of details on it yet. It looks very herby, but I know I know TMC, and I know he's always putting a little bit extra into that. What are the other two? Oh, the Mommy Bay. That one's like the that one's like the uh what's the the crab seasoning, right? Yeah, it's like it's an old bay ripoff, but it's better because it's the TMC doing it. So <laughs> there's the Mommy Bay and then the Falls Demise, which I believe is I don't want to say it's pumpkin spice, but it's pumpkin spice inspired. So by the way, can we stop with the pumpkin spice hate? <laughs> Mad Canadian goes, no, it's just pumpkin spice. <laughs> I, know, Jared, I know you're going to go into a spiel about pumpkin spice and people hate that, but I went shopping today. Yeah. Oktoberfest is out now. It's too early. It is out. And I love Oktoberfest beer, but it's just too, too early. Yeah. Anyway. Mad Canadian, he's got three new spices coming at the end of August. He has an Italian blend called the Dawn A, the Mommy Bay, which is, you know, it's a it's a it's a lot like Old Bay seasoning, but but it's the Mad Canadian, so I'm sure it's coming across far more natural with less junk in it now. And then the pumpkin spice, which again, it's basically pumpkin spice, but it's the Mad Canadian, so you know the ingredients are fresh, and there's not a bunch of chemical nonsense in there. So you have to check out the Mad Canadian Barbecue Company at themadcanadianbbq.com. Link is in the master link, or you can probably just Google Mad Canadian Barbecue Company. That's going to get you there. If you're listening to this more than a week out, you can always use Sloopcast 10 at checkout to get 10% off. But if you're listening to this the week it comes out, by Friday... You can use Old Man 30 celebrating Mr. Mad Canadian himself's birthday. Old Man 30. He's not 30, I don't think. Mad Canadian. But the promo code is Old Man 30. If you were a real friend, Mad Canadian, I'm looking at the Discord chat as if he can see me. Or as if I could see him. 
you would have done it for your age. <laughs> Uh, uh, but yeah, you can use old man 30 at checkout to get 30% off your entire order. He said he'd take way too big of a hit if he did his actual age. <laughs> uh, old man 30 at checkout, madcanadianbbq.com. He's got your butts covered. 